Today we're very happy to have Roland Lavalley, a um, longtime East Porter and a uh, wonderful wood carver. Um, he's been here before. He tells me about seven years ago. I lose track of those things, but uh, uh, <coughs> we wanted to have him come back because his work continues to startle and amuse many. And you've got some examples of it here. Uh, I, I think um, um, you know, many of our uh, artists talk about uh, their, their uh, drive to, to uh, make these uh, objects that they make and the beauty and so on. And of course, we're very interested in that. I think Roland, uh, in particular, will want to talk about making it as an artist in Eastport, Maine, which is a topic that's uh, of interest to many of us. I'll let him take it on from here. Please, Roland. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks for coming. Uh, I hope everyone's got a, a raffle ticket. Uh, at the end, we're going to raffle off this bird here to the winner. And I have uh, various stages of production here, which I'll go over a little bit later. Can everybody hear me all right? Okay, good. Uh, let's see. Uh, I moved to Eastport, I uh, moved to this area in 1977. Landed in Callis and uh, stayed there for about six months and I bought a place in Charlotte and I lived there for a, quite a while. Yeah, but I always worked in Eastport. I came to Eastport and found a job right away in the textile mill. And uh, I worked there for years and years, quite a few years. Uh, but originally I'm from Connecticut. From a place called uh, Fall Mountain, which was about four miles from town, and it was pretty much all uphill and curvy to get there. So we were kind of like out of town, and uh, I grew up on a lake, and I've actually pretty much stayed on a lake the, my whole life. I live on the water now. For a while I was living in Callis and I could, from where I was living with a bow and arrow, I could put an arrow in the water, so it's pretty close to the water. Uh, so, you know, I learned a lot from being on the water. Always attracts wildlife, a lot of things to do. Uh, so we're, I was in Connecticut on Fall Mountain four miles out of town, and it was like a remote area, and you're all familiar with Connecticut, where they have the imaginary sign that says, welcome to Connecticut, make sure you're dressed right. <laughs> Fall, Mart Fall Mount was like a whole different category, because we were so far out of town. Uh, not too many people went there. We had, it was like on the edge of development there, so there was a lot of woods and all. And there, there was a, well, it's kind of hard to put this in, a few bad families out of the area that gave Fall Mountain a certain prestige that kept a lot of people away. <laughs> a, lot of the, a lot of the local folks up there, especially kids, uh, found it was pretty safe. You could, you could deal with the other kids pretty good. You run into problems. Like, I remember getting shot with a BB gun by some of the, one of the guys. But if you handle it right, you come out okay. Uh, I've always developed, for being in that situation where there was a lot of problems around, I always developed the attitude of don't stay in one place too long. Do what you're doing, keep moving. <laughs> and uh, spent a lot of time in the woods. So I spent a lot of time hunting and fishing. Trapping and camping, and uh, we camped, but we didn't like camp camping campgrounds. We camped on state land where you could go, and you didn't really have a campsite. You could just go camp, and they had a fire pit there, but it wasn't. There was no constrictions really back then. This was a long time ago. This was in the seventies, and uh, I did. Uh, Growing up in the woods and stuff, I did a lot of carving myself and uh, a lot of woodcraft. And that really came in 
came in handy doing the woodcraft. I remember uh, going, well, I used to hang around with a friend called Nels for years and years, and we'd go camping all the time. And, uh, you know, after several years, he says to me, you know, we always go camping, and, uh, you know, we, has, we always have some kind of woodcraft to cook things on and stuff, and it all works. It never screws up. So it was a, it was a good trait to have. And like this is one of one of the things I put under my arm that I used in the future in the way I conducted my life and what I like to do. Um, I had an uncle when I was growing up who worked in the Dover book publishing plant in Massachusetts. And they would come down, him and his wife would come down and spend some time at, with my parents, or old friends of my parents, for years and years. And his trunk would be loaded with books from the, uh, the, the trash bin of the plant that were missing covers, that were missing chapters. Uh, just a lot of good information that was coming. It was all coming to me. I had my pick of whatever was there, and it was, it was wildlife books. There was books on uh, mind the Nazi Germany, uh, crossword puzzles, you name it. But there was a lot of wildlife books, some books on carvings, all that stuff. And I, uh, you know, we went through it. We gave books away, but I kept a good selection of wildlife books for myself. I think I got a full set of the. Uh, written text of the birds of North America by Audubon. It took many years to do it. But I, you know, I got one book at a time, because a lot of them were, were trash. But uh, it was real good. It was in black and white. A lot of uh, photos were in black and white. And a lot of really good information in there that really helped me out in the long run. Measurements and all kinds of stuff. So. Uh, Went through school, went to Terryville High School, had a general working class education, and I was not given many college courses at all. Uh, I think my marks were kind of low, but I, personally I think uh, being a hunter and a trapper and all that stuff, I think my coat smelled too much like skunk scent. <laughs> to be accepted by the person who would send me to college. Uh, and uh, one good thing is I had five years of wood shop. That came in really handy. And I had some wood shop in uh, junior high school too. So I had a good, a good understanding of wood growing up. And in my house we had a basement with uh, a lot of tools you would use to build things. And uh, you know, building box traps and all kinds of stuff growing up. Uh, and all that, all that, just like I said, it's another thing in my, my pack or under my arm that I was going to use in my life afterwards. Uh, we had art classes in school too. I had a couple art classes, but the teacher tended to be focused on students with good college courses provided by the school. And uh, the skill of doing art. You know, there's a lot of people that just do art like that right off the bat, you know, and they're, they're real good at it. So I found the teachers kind of focused on them. And they weren't strong on the other qualities you need to have to be an artist. A lot of those that I had. But I was pretty good at art too, but. Not like, not like some people that were just like, it was under their skin. That's exactly what they did automatically. Um, so, uh, you know, I went through high school, graduated high school. I didn't go to college. I had a chance to go to college because my folks were over 65, so I had a chance to go. But that wasn't in the program for me. Uh, 
Uh, I took several jobs after graduation. Uh, one of them was a security guard on the night shift at various factories, so I got to see how industry worked, step by step by step by step. And uh, that was very good. And uh, let's see, I also took a job at an iron foundry before I moved to Maine. And the iron foundry was real good too, because you got to see the process of mold making and making patterns and pouring and all that stuff, which is you know, for me, a sculptor, it's like right up there. So I stayed there a while, and then uh, you could see that you can't spend a lot of time in an iron foundry, can you? It was dirty air and hot temperatures and all that stuff. So I had a friend in Maine and uh, made arrangements to come up here to Callis, look for work. Uh, applied at the uh, uh, pulp mill in Woodland for a job. Then I figured I'd go down the coast and apply for a job, and I got the eSport and found a job right off the bat. So I uh, started working there. It was at the textile mill, and I stayed there from 77 till probably 1996, 1996. So a good time. It was uh, pretty good in there. Uh, when I first took the job there, I worked there maybe like, oh, maybe six months in Milburn. So I had time to do some of the things that I wanted to do as they were taking time to rebuild the mill. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to do was I liked to hunt. And boy, there were black ducks around here like you wouldn't believe back then. See 500 black ducks just driving into Eastport. So I made some decoys to hunt, hunt some ducks, and uh, all they were very crude and primitive. They worked. We got a few ducks, and uh, kind of set the hook right there. I think for carving carving birds. Uh, L.L. Uh, let's see. So I started carving some decoys for sale because. It took a while for them to build the mill back up. Life goes up and down. You know, uh, I got divorced and stuff. I needed extra money. So I just started to carve some decoys to sell at some of the stores. So I carved, carved a few, and I sold a few. I didn't sell a whole lot. Uh, I studied uh, the L.L. Bean catalog and wildfowl decoys by a fellow named Barber. They had nice drawings in there, little stories and stuff. So it was all good, and you know, I kept selling, selling things. Uh, it took a long time. And then the Eastport Gallery moved to town. And uh, back, I don't know, uh, Joyce, Joyce Weber was in charge of getting the gallery up and going. She wanted me to join the first year, and I couldn't do it because I had other things going. The second year I joined, I stayed with them for a long, long time. Um, uh, let's see. So I was, st I was, the Eastport Gallery kind of let me move up a little from doing the decoys. I viewed what other artists were doing and uh, expanded my process a little. Because there was, before that, there was nothing in town. There was one guy selling paintings on pieces of slate. A few people selling artwork here and there, but there was, there was nothing fabric that, that you could join to really move, motivate yourself. And that did. There was a lot of good artists there. talked to a lot of good people. And uh, I'll get into that a little later. Um, so, let's see. Uh, so, it was, it was slow. Uh, sales were slow. I was making some money, which was good, considering I didn't have any money back then. Uh, uh, I needed to study marketing, so I read a lot of books on marketing, selling knives door to door. I mean, there was everything in there. You could think of old books that are passe now, but it all, it all kind of made sense. The process made sense and everything. Um, let's see. So I sold some pieces at different shops, and uh, 
saw them at uh, festivals, sales at festivals. Uh, that that was always slow, and I always thought that would be a bonanza. But it just never worked for me. And this is this is just my opinion as an artist. I mean, another artist could come up, come to town and do festivals and make so much money and throw me right in the spit. I just never had that kind of luck. Try it hard, try it all over. You make a little sometime, and the next time you, know, you don't make any, and I don't know, just didn't work for me. So let's see. Uh, so uh, uh, I did festivals, and I kept studying about artists, how to sell your stuff, and toured the coast, studied all the art shops, and sold different types of art, carvings, and looked at what people were selling, how they were selling, the type of art, and how they were doing it. Spent a lot of time learning through magazines, which back in the 1980s was a real good source of finding information. They had, and they still do now, they have magazines that follow a certain topic, you know, I'm just on carving, you're just on woodworking. So you learn a lot from them, and being out here in Eastport, you needed all the, all the help you could get, really. Uh, <coughs> bringing new ideas. Uh, I also sold, uh, or took orders from putting carvings in glass display boxes in sporting camps in northern Maine, uh, looms. That worked out good, but the travel was unbelievable. You know, you'd have to bring them there in, in one time a year, and then they'd be on display all summer, and then you'd have to pick them back up in the fall. And I remember there was one place, it was like a three mile walk in the woods, it was just, it was just tough. Uh, it's, it was good to do. I got my word around. I made sales and I got double sales off the people that bought but it's just to do it all the time. It just it wouldn't work. Not for me. I suppose if I had enough money to go to the sporting pack, sporting camp and put my, my feet up and grab a fishing pole and sit on the dock and talk to everybody, I'd have a better chance. But I was working at the textile company. I didn't have a lot of extra money, believe me. Um, uh, we'll see. So, uh, still studying birds, what people were carving through magazines and stuff. Uh, I went from carving the crude, crude working decoys, which were my first decoys, were so crude that I had to uh, hang a string off the bottom with a spark plug on them to keep them upright in the water. <laughs> So I went from the crude decoys to uh, to uh, like a, a more fabricated working type decoy, to a decorative decoy, to uh, bird carvings, like this one here, and then to birds in motion with the wings out, which was real good because then you know, when you get the wings out on a bird, you can show power and speed, uh, determination of one species over another. I really like that. I find in my shop, with the tourists we have here, that really, it impresses people, but it's hard to sell stuff like that. Here, maybe in other places it would work. Like I said, this is my own, my own, <clears throat> my own view of the, the carving world in Eastport. So, uh, let's see. Uh, so, in the mag magazine sales, it showed doing a bird like this. He'd be uh, on a nice piece of driftwood, and it'd be a nice polished wooden base here. And it looked wicked nice, you know, something you would see in a, a gallery or a, a museum or something like that. So I did a lot of those, and they were impressive, but it slowed people down. People would much rather buy something like this, in my experience. Here. So that's what I ended up doing, uh, making more pieces like that and less with a, with a polished base. So in 1984, I opened my shop, which is called Crow Tracks. It's up here on Water Street. Uh, it's, one, it's a one-room showroom. And uh, the next year, I joined the Eastport Gallery. That was 1985. And uh, <clears throat> what I ended up doing was selling the smaller pieces at Crow Tracks, and then selling more uh, expansive pieces at the Eastport Gallery, where I had more room. Of course, that varied from year to year by the amount of room we had there. 
from different locations because we moved around quite a bit. But generally, I had a lot more room there than in my shop, so I could do some bigger pieces. And a lot of times, at the end of the season, you know, I might, might have a nice piece of driftwood like this with maybe three or four birds on it. it took up a lot of space. It was really impressive to see. Uh, people on vacation aren't, in my opinion, aren't willing to take something that, like that around with them to get it back home. So at the end of the season, I just take it out of the back from the Eastport back gallery and cut it up with the smaller pieces and mount them on smaller pieces and sell them out. So it, it seemed to work okay. Uh, in about 1990, I started, uh, in the 1990s, I started painting, doing acrylic paintings on wooden pallets, wooden panels. I would carve in a frame, it, it detail it with a wood burner. This one's detailed with a wood burner and then paint over it. And then uh, I paint in, with acrylic in the middle. And that was a lot of fun because being an artist carving birds and kind of like stuck in that mode with a bird on the driftwood all the time. Whereas when you do it paintings, you could do you know species, people interacting, you could do funny things. It was just a lot more fun. So that was a that was great for a while. I did an awful lot of those, and I haven't been doing them many recently. Just kind of shifted out of that. Uh, oh, let's see. Oh, in 1999, I started my own website, uh, www.crowtracks.com. It's right here on this little piece of paper. If you want to look it up at home. I update that once a year. I just updated it a couple weeks ago. Uh, and that, uh, on the website, it's more of a bulletin board website, or a, yeah, more like a bulletin board website. Uh, you go there and you find links to go to other websites that have my pieces for sale. Like there's a link there to my eBay store. There's a link there to my commercial Facebook page. And both of those pages sell quite well for me. Uh, I tried other internet sites like Etsy. Did all right, but not as good as uh, eBay, eBay page or the Facebook page. The internet sites are good. They bring in steady money all winter long, all year long, and they come right out of the blue. I treat everybody the best. If they have any problem, just send the piece back and I refund your money. Uh, uh, they're good and steady and uh, good sales are a must. Uh, if you're trying to make a living at uh, selling art in eSport, you know, they're good sales company. Take care of them. So let's see, I stayed at the gallery from uh, 1985 to 2015. And I studied and watched lots of artists, including, including Elizabeth. Uh, I watched, uh, watched their sales, production, delivery, appointments, uh, their meetings and their attitudes. And we had lots and lots of artists there over those years lots of people so I got to see everything and it's in the mind of the artist you know they live, you know. it's hard it's hard to to imagine them as real focus because some of them are not focused at all you do have artists that are focused um, we'll see uh, Artists like uh, Don Dunbar and Elizabeth Ostrander, Ostrander were always focused on passion for working hard and persistence. They always did good work. They always focused on making money. And it was, it was really good. It was good. There was people like that that I was working with that would bring more, more power to me to be around people like that. Uh, other selling probably wouldn't be too focused on income. They were more focused on being an artist. Uh, many applied to be members of the gallery to, to be accepted as an artist and didn't want to put any time in. 
just to know they were, they were an artist. Uh, some wanted to be accepted, and then didn't even want to join. They just wanted to know that their work was that good. Uh, so many, there were many good artists and provided the operation with quality work and skill at running the gallery. It was a co-op gallery, so we all had to put time in working at the gallery and we all had to put time in on the board. And when you could find people that worked really well as a group, the gallery really functioned well. And by experience all these people, it really helped me develop my lifestyle as an artist. Um, and over, over the years of producing art, it's like one of the big stumbling blocks of producing art in uh, Down East Maine, or probably anywhere, but I mean Down East Maine, you talk to people more. And, I get a lot, it may be my shop too, where people come in and um, I get a conversation going with them, which is real important. But uh, You tend to get a lot of criticism from artists and viewers and business owners. And you have to get it through your head that you can, you know, you can listen to them. But, I mean, just like regular people, I mean, you listen to them, you kind of take it for granted what they're saying, you look into it, but they're just like regular people. Uh, uh, so I, I had one fella come in and I knew pretty good and he thought I ought to change the name of my business because he didn't like the name of my business. Uh, and this guy never owned or ran a business. So. And uh, many, many wanted me to change the way I produce my work and to fit their ideas of what sells. I do a lot. Uh, <clears throat> I went to this lady's house and she had this, this nice little mouse. It was about this long. It was, it was about. Uh, this is probably like this with all these lines etched in, but it was very simple. Um, I said, "Geez, I like that mouse. I'm gonna make a few of those." So, I came home. I made a mouse. <coughs> put on my Facebook, uh, my uh, eBay page. The next day it sold. I said, uh, it, you know, I wasn't getting a lot of money for it. I was only getting like twenty dollars or something. I said, but I found the winning piece here. I'm gonna make all kinds of money off these mice. <laughs> so I put another one on. It didn't sell. And then they didn't sell. I put them on there all the time. They didn't sell. It's just that first mouse I put on there sold. I don't know, maybe quirk of nature or something. I don't know. So we're at a party. I'm telling this lady about, oh, I found this mouse. It's really good. And, you know. So I made one, I put it on my eBay store, and it didn't sell. She says, I don't know what you do, you gotta paint them pink. And then she went right after me, like, I gotta paint my mice pink. So I never painted my mice my nice pink. I still sell the mice out of my shop. I don't do pink mice. And it might be good, she might have a great idea, I don't know, but it wasn't fitting my vision of what my business should look like. Uh, you know, a lot of people, if they want, if they want to um, have you carve something, they commission you to do it, and they're pretty much the boss. And they'll say, "Hey, I want you to do it this way for me, and I want you to do it this way and this way." And you take the commission; they pay you the money, and that all works good. It's a lot different than changing your whole lifestyle of how you're going to do art just on someone's whim. Uh, now, a lot of times I'm at my shop, and I get someone who comes in with some constructive criticism or a fault, they say. And I always, whenever someone comes in, I always listen to what they say. So I, you know, I'll go over with them, they'll tell me what the problem is, and I'll, I'll uh, go through the motions, whether they buy something, that's fine. Whether they don't, they don't. That's also a okay. Uh, many uh, the thing is, you gotta go. I have to go and look it up after they leave to see if they're just trying to mess with my head or they're telling me the truth. Like someone was telling me that the eyes on this one bird were wrong color; they should be red. Sure enough, they left. I looked it up. It, she was right; they were supposed to be red. 
So, okay. you know, like when you're in a shop like that and people tell you stuff, you have to kind of decide whether they're critics or they're trying to help you out and whether they're sane or they're just plain crazy. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I tell you, when you're in a shop, you get all kinds of people in there. Uh, let's see. Yeah, many, many people pass me on books on art, which is good. I get that a lot. People buy it. I have books on uh, birds from England, and they they say, "Hey, I got a real nice book here. I don't want it. You want it? And I'm sure you get something out of it, and it's just fabulous, you know." So people do that all the time, and that that really helps, and I really appreciate. It. So we move on to the process of development. Um, the, so the best way, in my opinion, is to stay focused on your long-term goals. Um, you know, the old saying is you go through path and you, uh, the path of life and you, you come across many many forks in the trail, or trail, and choosing the right path is important. <clears throat> so you probably ask yourself why or how you do it this way. I don't have a clue. It just, <laughs> it just works, and there's paths all the time. I mean, whatever you do, whatever you do, there's paths. You just gotta choose the right path. Try to avoid people who do not have a good vision on being productive. And I read that in a book. It also said that hanging around with productive people would be more productive. It, it kind of makes sense. You know, people that, people that attract a lot, of, <laughs> a lot of attention from the lawn stuff, you really don't want that <laughs> stuff going around in your shop. <laughs> I don't know. Um, everyone runs into problems in their life, you know, and you got to deal with them. You know, the less, the less you do that's involved in your business, the better. Um, um, so when you're going going down the path of life, you do, you run to these choices. Um, there's choices in lifestyle, communication, art development, and like I can say they're they're risky. And you, you take chances on ideas a lot, um, especially with the ideas in art development. Um, a lot of the times you take the path and you fail. You take another path and you fail. But you're really probably learning something good when you're failing. And you got to keep your mind open to that. You, it's a different method than you normally do. It might not come out the way you want it in art development, but you're coming out with something. You know, all that one thing that you come up with, out with, might not be exactly what you want. It's probably gonna lead you into something better in the long run. You know, just, you go down, you come, you make a decision, it's not what you want, but guess what? There's another fork in the road right there. So you take another fork in the road and see where you go. That's why uh, a lot of painters, they do, so many copies of one work, and it's not copies, they're doing different versions of the same piece over and over and over again to explore different different ideas, I believe. I find in running my shop, uh, I have, in making my work, I have to keep my work like in a box, my ideas in a box in my mind as far as sales go. And uh, inside the box, let's see, in my shop, it's usually a carved bird on a base. Um, I try not to get weird. When I, when, when I, weird isn't the right word for it, uh, too experimental. Um, I know what sells. I know the kind of birds it sells, you put them on a base, for me, I, I can move them pretty good. I can make a, a good living in East Sport doing that. If 
I want to go out of that and start working on different styles and stuff. Then you're kind of expanding <clears throat> your vision and then you have to come up with new ways of selling them and things like that. It takes time, it takes new tools, it takes space, uh, it takes room for storage. Whereas if I just do birds in a box, in my mind, I could just keep moving them. We just, everything just moves quite well. It, it's a lot of fun to do other things. And you could have a blast making all kinds of different kinds of art. But as far as keeping my shop running, I have to do that. Keep, keep my parameters up, work with inside, my, inside the box, and things will go well. A lot of the work process I developed over the years is from working in industry, working in the textile mill, working as the uh, security guard and all that, watching how you know, the pieces come in one end of the mill and they go out the other end of the mill all finished. And you go step by step by step, watching the different processes for each each worker, how they do it. And uh, it, I find that really important. It gives you structure, uh, lets you build on, on ideas for progress. Um, things like easy things like taking breaks, taking lunches, uh, reading and watching videos. It's all it's all involved in that that study of industry over the years. I think. So now I can show you some of the, the work I do, how I do it. Uh, here we have a chickadee, and there's the finished product over there. I usually take, this is a piece of pine, uh, state tree, white pine. Sometimes I use basswood too, and uh, I draw the image on the bird, and uh, I usually saw the, the the negative parts with a power tool. I used to use a hand tool till I turned 62, and I said, that's enough of that. <laughs> so now, now I have a power saw, and it makes life easier. But it was real important to do it by hand. It gives it that extra power um, in my mind by doing it by hand. So this is what I do now. I, you know, I, I saw out the, uh, the negative spots, then you end up with a piece like this. A lot of rough forms on it, got to be whittled off. And I always, uh, X-Acto knife is one of my favorite tools to use. It's got a nice heavy hand, fits my hand. It's got a flat spot, won't roll off the table too easy. Uh, it's got a blade that uh, you just unscrew it, you throw away, you put a new blade in. Uh, this blade here. I sharpened it maybe about four or five times so far, so I don't know how much more sharpening I'm going to get before I end up chucking it. And I chuck blades all the time. <clears throat> Keep them nice and, nice and sharp, you know, just exactly what they're doing. And you could rely on them. So then I got the roughed out bird here. And uh, that's when you start with a hand. Do it by hand for yeah, that one. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to start by hand right there. Then, uh, Cut off the, the high edges, round it out, and, and twitch in the uh, feather pattern. And uh, then I sand it. And of course, everybody hates sanding. <laughs> Just time and time and time, and you got to sand it down. So then I sand it, and uh, then I uh, draw in the feather pattern. And the biggest, one of the biggest tools of carving I found is the pencil. You got to have the pencil. It's like drawing a map. You draw your feathers in place, you go over it with the, the knife, you raise them up, and it just, it, it just makes life a whole lot better. I usually start with like a 50 grit sandpaper, then a 100 grit 
great to hear. And then here is the, uh, the next step where I burn in the detail with a wood burner. It's got a rear stat on it so I control the, the flame in the, or the glow in the tip because it's, you could use it on a lot of different wood. So I use it on pine so I keep it in a certain area for the pine. I burn in uh, the feathers, which really, which is really good. You could raise them up. You burn in. Uh, I wouldn't do this on a small bird, but you burn in little uh, gaps in the feather, which makes it show real realism. And then after that's all done, I would go over and give that a, a good buffing down with uh, like a medium grit. Um, let's see, steel wool. Now that, that would buff it right down before I started painting it. Well, Roland, yeah. Can I ask, uh, does the wood burner have different blades, different sized blades as well? Sure does. Yeah, you could get, you could get an amazing amount of blades. Do you, do you use a whole variety of them? Or? Not too much. No. no I probably use uh, maybe two blades. Really? Yeah. There's a lot of. I mean. You could buy a blade for like one certain little thing like that. Uh, it depends, I don't know, it depends how detailed you want to make your carvings. I find I have to kind of make my carvings to fit into the people who come to Eastport and want to buy my carvings. Mm -hmm. And by having a lot of carvings there, I get to see what people want to buy, whether they want to buy a super elaborate one or they want to buy one that just has all the knife marks on it. You know, I had this here, and uh, someone came in and said, "Geez, I like the carving just like that without the paint on it." Just today they said that. So, you know, say that cross section, right? You, uh, it's got to have a wide variety, and I don't know I, I focus on one, one or two styles of blades, and that's kind of what I go with. Uh, but that's just my own reasoning. You know, another carver could come to town and do his own thing and sell a lot of great big ones. I don't, I don't know, this just seems to work for me. Uh, a lot of bird carvings, uh, you notice this one has carved in eyes. And uh, I do that myself. Uh, draw them on and uh, carve them in with a knife and then a wood burner. Round them off with the wood burner. Gives you, uh, a pretty nice handmade eye, and uh, I like that. I also make my own feet out of wire and thread. Uh, a lot of carvers, they buy glass eyes and put them in their birds. And they buy uh, feet that are made out of uh, pewter, which tend to break. And I know, uh, I think uh, Lawrence Lindley in town used to make bird carvings. And I prepared a lot of his birds with my own feet because the feet on his birds broke over the years. Uh, so I like to make my own. It's, it gives, uh, it gives it a nice uh, steadiness when you put the bird on the base. You know, you put your bird on the base and if he's too cockeyed or something, you, there's no give in there. You just bend them the way you want them and wham on, he's right there. So. Uh, that was good. That was real hard to do. I studied all kinds of birds' feet from different carvers. A lot of them were, were just like a wire coming off the birds with little pieces of uh, thread glued to the wood to make it look like toes. And uh, I mean, they were they were good, but that's not nothing what I got. That's a lot better. Those are very durable. They'll be around for a long time. All my pieces, I try to plan for at least an easy hundred years. Uh, everything's made good. When I glue the bird legs in there, uh, the holes are glued first, glue in the holes and glue on the, on the on the bird's feet. So it's like double glue in there. Everything, everything's on there good. So then, uh, then I start painting my birds, paint with acrylics. That works good for me. It can move right along. If you really have to dry them off fast, you can, uh, Put them near the wood stove, or blow them with a blow them with a hair dryer. It dries them down, and uh, lets you move right along. I 
put them on bases and uh, these two birds are on pieces of beaver stick. I really like those, especially with the chickadees. And I was real fortunate this year. I was canoeing this one lake and I found all kinds of beaver sticks. I don't know what the beavers were doing, but they had all kinds of, they were all about like this. So I went by and I got them all in the canoe. So I got them all dried out. Uh, it gives, I mean, for people coming to Maine, you're from the city, uh, you know, you're from an apartment and then, you know, you go into a store and you could buy a hand carved bird on a piece of beaver stick. That's a real treasure, you know? So. And then it, that's the bird at the end right there. The one we're going to raffle off. Have fun. I like the chickadees. Okay. So, some of the things an artist has to do with selling their art. The first thing is you have to talk. To, you have to speak with strangers. And like I said, I was at the gallery for a long time, um, working there, and, and a lot of people don't like talking to strangers. They just don't. I mean, you gotta, if you're not good at it, you gotta go out of your way and make sure you're good at it. If you wanna sell your art, and if you don't wanna sell your art, that's all right too. Just make your art and sit on it. I mean, but if you wanna sell it, you gotta talk to people. It just kinda, kinda works that way. I read a lot of books on sales, like I said earlier, and, uh, you know, like, there was a lot of tricks in it, like, everybody's, everybody, if you have something you want to sell, everybody's a customer. You don't care what their car looks like, you don't care what their color of their skin looks like, you don't care what their hair looks like, um, you don't care what their clothes looks like, I mean, there's just people out there who like to buy stuff. I mean, that's all there is to it. You got to accept that. Uh, and yeah, problem with that, you just might not want to sell that much of your art. You know, you just I don't know. I'm 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 very nice to all the people who come into my shop. And they're all very nice to me. Everything works out pretty good. Uh, I did have one lady that didn't want to wear a mask. She left and she never came back. Uh, let's see. Uh, marketing your art sounds easy, but it's it's pretty difficult. Uh, let's let's say you, you make good art, whatever that means. But let's just say you make good art. So uh, trying to sell it in stores are hard. Shops. Uh, many of the people who run the shops. They want your items in their store because you're making good art. It dresses up their shop a lot. They don't have to pay anything for it. But they push their own items because they get more on each sales. And uh, I always found it depressing, you know, because you got to make a lot of trips there. You're not selling anything. You're just going there and your pieces are still on the wall. You know, if you just starting in the art sales business, it's going to affect your mind a little bit. Uh, festivals, you know, that's one of the things that I gripe about Eastport. Not a gripe about something, but we've got too many festivals around here. Everybody wants to run a festival. There's two weeks going on with nothing going on, so let's run a festival. Everybody make all kinds of money. I don't know. Uh, I sold a lot of pieces during festivals because I've been in business a long time. Um, oh boy, you have to. There's a lot of people coming to town. A lot of people doing certain festival things, but they're not really interested in what's going on. I remember that when I first started I had some pieces in Callis for the International Festival in a gift shop and they, those people were serious about me and my art and everything and nothing sold there. So then I had some down here at Dimpy shop. Dimpy used to have a, a 
the place across from the library up there. And uh, thus it sold out of there too. And I'm just like, what the heck is going on? But people have a different mindset when they go to festivals and it's really hard to, to sell, pe sell pieces there. A lot of times at festivals you have to be mobile and move your pieces from festival to festival and you might have to go up and down the country doing that and that's beyond anything that would come to my mind but I know one guy that does it and he runs his whole, his whole family runs on that so they've got it figured out really good. Um, you have to go back to the same place, place year after year, you have to remember people from each festival and build on that. It, it's, it's really tough. <coughs> galleries, uh, galleries work well, but there's things you have to worry about galleries too. Uh, you might have to pay 30 to 70 percent on some of your artwork in some galleries. That's back to the gallery owner who makes the sale. So uh, uh, that's it's pretty heavy, but I mean, if you're selling great big pieces of art, that kind of falls into place. I mean, a lot of it depends on how well the gallery could find buyers for your art, too. And there's a lot to it. Uh, you also have to meet with buyers, and so then again, you got to talk to buyers. If you have to meet with buyers, it goes back to what I was talking to beforehand. You got trip expense and you have one person shows you have to do too so all that adds in you have to throw that into what you're getting out of the gallery the eastboard gallery in town here is a, a it's a cooperative gallery it makes it good with low commission rates on pieces itself but you do have to put a lot of it a lot of time in there and uh, that might be hard for a lot of people um, other things you have to, uh, should do if you're going to sell art in Eastport or sell art period is uh, do public speaking. Uh, that's always been real tough. I went to WCCC, let's see, <coughs> when the mill closed that I was working, we, I had a chance to go to WCCC, it was the second time. Chance to go to college, so I went up there to get a degree for business management. So I learned public speaking up there, which was pretty good. And they, very good crew up there, a lot of good teachers. They treated me real well, and they got me up in front of talking to all kinds of people. Um, they taught me computer skills, which was really good. I didn't even know how to type, so all that. They taught me how to build my own website, which was real important. Was it the WCCC? Uh, Washington County Community College. Oh. It's in Callis. Uh, photography is, uh, uh, taking images, photography is real important. You gotta learn that. Uh, uh, making business information, you gotta learn that. Very important, how to do your uh, cards and uh, promoting your business. Proofreading, that's another thing up to CCC they, they taught me how to do. Uh, you have to keep track of sales transactions and you have to take care of your books. Whether you want to do your books or not, or you want to hire someone to do your books, it's totally up to you. Uh, other organizations are also important. Let's see, I was a member of the I am a member of the Chamber of Commerce. I was on the board, president for a couple of years. Uh, uh, let's see, uh, I was on the board up, student board up the Washington County Community College, and uh, also on the board of uh, the Eastport Gallery and the Friends of the Moosehorn. And all those pl places helped me out immensely. It's a lot of extra work, gets your mind going in a different direction, and uh, I don't know. 
when you're in business, you need all the help you get. You're talking to more people, and like I said, it helps you out. So, thanks for listening to my talk. I'm glad everybody showed up, and uh, I think I ought to be open for questions and answers if there's any questions out there. Yeah, Rob, you said earlier uh, that you have a pretty good idea of what sells. You've been doing this for about 40 years. Has that changed over time? What sells? Uh, I, I know what my vision of what sells changed over the years. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I really wanted to do decoys, but. Well, decoys just don't sell around here, and, and things have changed since then too. But even back then, it was like, if you look at decoys, there was a there was area between Long Island and North Carolina, which was really big for decoys. Everyone was crazy there, and also where the Ohio River hit the Mississippi, and then at the base of the Mississippi in Louisiana. Those are all big decoy areas, and they sell lots of decoys out there. But people coming to Eastport <coughs> really weren't interested in decoys too much, mainly because down in the, in the areas I told you about, there was a lot of money going around, and the people sounds funny you know, talking about the old days and lots of money but people people would make hollow decoys out there down there that were lighter they were more well balanced things like that the workmanship was higher in Maine it was like an old farmer who said oh, I'm gonna go dark hunting this fall I'm gonna make a couple decoys he went in the barn he chopped out a few and they had crooked heads and he probably had spark plugs off the bottom to keep them up you know, they weren't, they weren't precise decoys. They weren't exquisite like they were in some spots. So Maine doesn't have a good following of quality decoys. You find decoys in Maine, and a lot of people collect them too. And they, a lot of them bring in good prices, but it's not like down on uh, you know, Chesapeake Bay or you know, down there. They're more specialized down there. Did you stop, <coughs> excuse me, did you stop making the little tree men that you carved? Did I stop making tree men? Yeah. Remember the, the faces that you carved in the... Oh, yeah. You still make those? Yeah, I still make them. I haven't made any in a while, but I still make them. Yeah. I bought one years ago for my father. Oh, yeah. I had done one the other day. I did a... Uh, what the heck was it? It was a, it was a, it was a bird on a branch that went on a wall. It was a bird on top of the branch, and the branch itself had two eyeballs and like a nose hanging off, of it. so it looked like a horse's head or something like that. And I put the bird on top. It looked real good. Totally, I don't know. I haven't done one like that before, but it came out nice. Yeah. Um, how do you choose the Four feathers, I, I don't know what you call them, the carvings that go over doors. How do you choose the themes for those? Oh, yeah. I have one and I love it. Yeah, the door toppers. Yeah, on, on top of a, a door. You know, uh, I made a door topper. They're probably about this long, not that high. They come like this, like that, a carving frame edge around it and then inside sealed and painted. Uh, how do I come up with the scenes for that? Just out of, it's, it's like in the springtime. I do, I start replacing inventory after Christmas. I work real hard, get my inventory looking good. Like right now in my shop, my inventory is looking good. And I wait for springtime and springtime just never really comes. <laughs> I started getting bored and I'm just thinking to do that something I could put in there that will attract people. Sometime I do an art theme. I think you bought one of the art theme with some I bought, cherubs. I bought the two cherubs. Yeah, yeah. My sister and I. I have a twin sister. So yeah. That's the theme that I like.
So sometimes I, I do art themes, and sometimes I do wildlife themes. Um, One uh, winter you did carrots. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but that wouldn't be in the door yeah. toppers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I did, I did chipmunks, chipmunks playing golf, <laughs> and, and uh, door toppers. Uh, yeah, it, it just. Just what's on your mind, what's haunting your mind, get it out of your mind. As soon as you get that out of your mind, you get something else coming in. It's like a steady flow. <laughs> don't, don't let it back up, you know, it just sure. it keeps on coming. Well, I think you have a great variety, and I'm always loving the, the, the chickadees, because I think you once told me you started carving them, or you liked carving them, because when you were in the woods by yourself, they were your companions, they always kept you, you know, and so I thought that was very tender. But the last time I was in your studio, you ha were working on this extraordinary owl, mm -hmm. and it's so detailed, and the feathers were just, oh, it was just an exquisite piece. They were so detailed, and, and as much as I love these little birds, because they're, they're really <laughs> you. But that was just such a leap into some other place, and the commitment you had to it. So. So what's happened to that? Uh, the person that, it wasn't really a commission. The guy said he wanted an owl, and he didn't uh -huh. really care. He wanted yeah. a flying owl. He didn't care anything about it. He just wanted it to come out good. Right. So it's fine with me. I finished it off and I mailed it down to him. He was a lucky guy. Yeah, he was, was a lucky guy, yeah. It was a gorgeous, gorgeous piece. And for me, just seeing how your work has changed and expanded, it's always a great thing to be witness of to somebody who's working with the art. And, and I love you, you're the only artist I know who's, who's and so you didn't go the, to the art classes and all that traditional stuff, but your art was created out of your love of the woods and and uh, and being in the woods and, and hunting and, and that aspect of, of life. And you're, the only, you're unique in that. I know no other artist who your art was generated from that, which I think is super special. Yeah, uh, I, I know what you mean. I think, like, if you go to Montana and places like that, you might find more artists like that. Uh -huh. But around here, it's kind of, you know, kind of rare. But uh, I enjoy, when you're talking about the owl, I enjoy doing the big pieces like that. And I got a good price for that owl, but, you know, I could do two of those a year. That's about all I could right. handle. Because yeah. it's something you work at for a while and you say, oh, that's enough of that. And then you go start working on the chickadee. You get the chickadee out of the way. <laughs> you know, then, oh, yeah, right. maybe I spend some more time on the owl and go back there. And if you got a, a, a fellow who wants to pay you, you know, you just send me a, he would just send me a check. they would come in the mail. So how's the owl doing? He'd send me, send me a check. That was good. I would, could you use like some more of those people? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> he sounds like a, <laughs> a really good guy. Love your work. <laughs> yeah. So that was good. That was it was yeah. a beautiful well, owl and it had a beautiful paint job on it. And it sure did. I was. I thought that was a spectacular. Is there a picture on your website of that owl? <laughs> I should. <laughs> I will. Maybe give me a week. <laughs> I got the photos. Aren't you doing another bird for that fella? He talked Gee. about doing a raven, but uh, I haven't. We haven't gotten down to the details yet. So. I was wondering, do you do you ever use uh, drumroll and like burrs uh, to carve things, or is that sacrilegious to? Uh, and carved, uh. I know what you mean. I've read all kinds of articles on people using those. I just kind of fell into my own comfort zone. And that's kind of where I stay. Um, I have a set, but I really don't use it too much. A little bit I might, but I'm not. It's like some people would do all this with that machine, all the burning. They would do all that, and they do beautiful pieces. They put in more texture too. But uh, I find being here in Eastport, I have to keep my birds in a certain price range. Amount of time, you know, just 
when it works. How long did it, does it generally take you, like for the chickadee, how much time would you give yourself to go from the block to the finish line? Okay, I could do two and a half a day. You're kidding. That, After 40 years of calling. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that's in the winter time too. If it's the summertime, when people are coming in and talking all the time, and you're running your business, it doesn't work. That they get done one a day, in summer. You, know, you got, you, you got, you got to pan things out. Uh, John Wodowski in town builds uh, uh, violins, and he bought himself a timer so he could time the amount of time he has in the violin, making the violin. You know, that doesn't include thinking about it in advance and stuff like that, because all that takes time too. And he's, he's well trained at it, and he, he knows what he's doing. But he, he just uses the timer to find out just exactly how much time he has in the violin. So I often thought of doing that, but I never got that far yet. Is there anything that you've really thought you'd love to make or choose to Boy, that's a good question. Yeah. And maybe keep it once you make it. <laughs> oh, keep it? Uh-uh. <laughs> no way. I actually, I even carved the uh, carving of my mother after she passed away oh and God. sold that. <laughs> the lady was delighted with it. I'll tell you. <laughs> no, I I move everything. I've got, I've got decoys that I hunt over, that I've hunted over for years, and I love those. They're not, they're well used and everything. They're not super spectacular, but you know, they're part of my passion. And actually, I find that with the decoys that I'm getting too old to carry the wooden ones around anymore. So. Yeah. Um, I don't know, is a decoy to attract the birds? Yeah. Or, and does it have to be a certain quality to be convincing to the birds? You were saying that some aren't really... How easy is it to, to fool a bird? <laughs> uh, well, a lot of things have changed. You know, with decoys, when they first started doing decoys, they made them out of, like, hemp. And they wove it all, the Indians would weave it all together and stuff. And tool grass, things like that. And then, and then they started making them out of uh, wood. Uh, and then we started making them out of uh, cork. And then it went to plastic. And now they have things, plastic tube socks. And they have things you stick in the ground. They flap their wings like this to look like birds in flight. I mean, there's a whole progression of stuff. And, I mean, once you once you got above the Once you got into the plastic, all the value went out of them. You know, the, the old ones out of cork were, were very valuable. The old ones out of wood were very valuable and still are. But uh, they, uh, I find that even the primitive bird, my primitive people going to bring in birds. You know, they all, they all come in, they all, they all wonder what's going on. How many decoys do you have to put out to attract live birds? Will one do it, or do you need two or six or what? Some places use uh, hundreds. Come on. Hundreds. Okay. And I use around here. I usually use maybe like six. Okay. Six or eight. Does it matter if they're painted as a male or a female? Males show up better, so I w most hunters would probably. Uh, my suggestion is that you would probably use three quarter male and the other quarter uh, females. I don't know. Yeah, females. Uh, females show up better. Okay. Are you a good shot? 
Uh, I could hold my own. <laughs> oh, I think you need to talk about the time that you, you pulled the eagle. This is a small pile. Here's the ticket right here. And the ticket is 69588. All right. I don't have my glasses on. That's it. Thank you, Roland. Well, thank everybody for showing up and listening. Roland won't tell you, but I'll tell you. He he had a decoy. He, he had a bunch of decoys out one time, and um, an eagle got attracted oh, yeah. and came down and grabbed one of his decoys and flew away with it <laughs> until he got. I mean, when an e you fool an eagle, that's that's pretty damn good. And he got it up fairly high, and he went. <laughs> <laughs> and he threw it, and Roland retrieved the eagle, the uh, decoy, and, it, and the eagle could duck its talons right into it. Wow. wow. It was pretty cool. And he sold that one. <laughs> right after he sold his mother. <laughs> and his dog. <laughs> the truth is coming out. <laughs> A friend of mine had a cat that had eagle talon holes in its head. What's that? A friend of mine had a cat that had eagle talon holes in its oh head. Oh, my word. <laughs> oh, my. Drop that cat, too. Yeah, well, yeah. that's a fair game, I uh, think. Roland did carve me once, and after he can sold I, his I mother, look at the evolution on the I sure. bought the carving of myself. You carve it off? <laughs> well, I <laughs> think it's one called wax. He did. I think the best carving <laughs> he's ever done <laughs> okay. was a, a, a